Good morning, Year 5. It's Wednesday the 27th of January, and this is our third reading lesson of the week. Please read our learning objective aloud. Great. So we're going to be learning to understand how the author has created suspense. Before we do that, we're going to consider three key pieces of vocabulary that will help us to articulate uh, to explain more effectively how the author has in fact created suspense in this particular passage of text. The first word that we're going to consider is one from the learning objective, suspense. Now, suspense is a noun, which means it's a, it's a state of being excited or anxious as a result of uncertainty or mystery. So, for example, think about when I announce the star of the day each day at the end of our uh, learning. I will often say, and the star of the day is. And then I deliberately pause. And the reason I dip, deliberately pause then is because I'm creating suspense. We're excited. We want to find out who the star of the day is going to be. So that's one example of suspense. There's lots of suspense in the story Alma, which you've been learning about in your writing lessons. For example, there's suspense as Alma enters the doll shop because we're uncertain about what is going to happen next. Let's practice saying the word. My turn. Suspense. 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 Good, well done, year five. Suspense is linked to the verb suspend. And suspend can have multiple meanings depending on the context. But in the context that we're thinking about, it means to stop something for a period of time. You can now see how the verb changes to become the noun suspense. And we can add the suffix f-u-l to change suspense into suspenseful. My turn, suspenseful. Suspenseful. Good. So we could say, for example, that if Alma is full of suspense, we could also say Alma is suspenseful. OK, because suspenseful is an adjective, so it's describing something which gives a feeling of suspense. I want to give you one further example of suspense before I pose this question. So the Odyssey, the text that we read at the beginning of year five. The Odyssey is a story which is full of suspense. In other words, the Odyssey is a suspenseful story. The reason that it is suspenseful is because there are many points throughout the story where we're left uncertain as to what will happen to Odysseus and therefore we're left in suspense. Okay, it's your turn to think now. So I'd like you to think about this question. What are some of the hallmarks, common characteristics, of suspense? Pause the video to write down your ideas. When you've done that, press play to continue the lesson. Great work, Year 5. So hopefully some of the hallmarks, common characteristics of suspense that you identified included pace, having a uh, pace which varies deliberately can help to create suspense within writing. Hinting at future plot developments, so what might happen in the story moving forwards, is a good way of creating suspense. It helps to keep the reader guessing, which is exactly what we did when we were reading the Odyssey. And finally, putting the characters in jeopardy. This means putting the characters at risk of danger. Again, the Odyssey included frequent moments where Odysseus and his sailors were in precarious situations, situations where they were exposed to great danger. And reading about that made us experience the feeling of suspense. So I have now explained to you several examples of how writing stories can be suspenseful. I'd like you to think about why Alma is an example of a suspenseful story. 
I'd like you to write down your response to that question. Pause the video to do so. When you've done that, press play. Off you go. Well done year five. So hopefully you identified the fact that Alma is a suspenseful story because there are multiple points throughout the story where the viewer is left feeling uncertain and unsure about what might happen to Alma next. For example, when Alma pivots on the spot and sees a doll in the shop window resembling her, that creates suspense because we wonder what's going to happen next. In a similar way, when Alma enters the shop and the door slams shut behind her, that helps to create suspense because the reader uh, anticipates that Alma is in danger. That links to what we just talked about, didn't we? The hallmarks of suspense, the fact that she's now in a position of jeopardy. Well done, Year 5. Let's move on. I'd like you to think about your own work as a writer. When have you written a text containing suspense? How was it suspenseful? Pause the video to jot down your ideas and then press play when you've done so. Great, it's really great that you've been able to come up with so many examples, uh, and perhaps the most recent of which is your warning tale that you've been learning to write remotely uh, via Miss Begum's video lessons. So that would be a great example of where you've been learning to create suspense in your writing. Well done. The next piece of vocabulary that is important to today's lesson is foreboding. My turn. Foreboding. 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 Great. Now, foreboding is a noun, and it's a strong feeling that something bad is going to happen. So you can see that foreboding and suspense are closely related. Think about the story of Alma once more. We get, as a viewer, we get a feeling of foreboding as Alma is about to enter the doll shop. Even just looking at this image here, we get a, a sense of foreboding because the doll appears quite creepy. So we get the feeling that something bad might be about to happen. And instead of saying, oh, I think something bad might be about to happen, a more effective way of writing that would be, I have a feeling of foreboding. And we can often say a feeling of foreboding. Sometimes we might say a sense of foreboding. So a feeling of foreboding, a sense of foreboding, my turn. A feeling of foreboding, a feeling of foreboding, and a sense of foreboding. A sense of foreboding. Good. Think back to our previous text, Phoenix. There were several places in Phoenix where the author created a sense of foreboding. For example, when the shadow ship descended and Lucky saw the shadow ship for the first time, there was a real sense of foreboding. We got the sense as readers, didn't we, that something bad was about to happen. And that did materialise, didn't it, with the death of Lucky's mother through the attack of the shadow guards. I'd like you now to apply your understanding of the word foreboding. Read this passage aloud and then respond to the question. How does this passage of writing create a sense of foreboding? You'll need to pause the video to complete that activity. Once you've done so, press play to continue the lesson. Go. Great job, Year 5. So hopefully one of the things that you identified was the fact that there is a strange uh, noise downstairs. The door ripping open. That creates a sense of uncertainty, doesn't it? What question does it make us want to ask as the reader? Yeah, great. What's that? Who's there? So it builds that uncertainty that we were talking about when we we're talking about suspense, doesn't it? And it makes us think that perhaps it might be something bad that's about to happen. Particularly the word ripping suggests that something bad is about to happen, doesn't it? I got out of bed to go and get Dad. The landing was pitch black. Again, the fact that it's pitch black suggests that something bad might be about to happen 
So a better way of phrasing that would be the fact that it's pitch black creates a sense of foreboding. Even more so the fact that the character couldn't find the light switch, the door ripped again. So something really is desperate to get into the building and, and, and get to Kester. And I wanted to cry out for him, but I couldn't. So we know that Kester's alone. So again, that builds upon this sense of foreboding, doesn't it? This sense that something bad is about to happen. Great work, if I've, let's move on. Okay, so the final question I wanted to consider here is what might an author do to create a sense of foreboding? Pause the video to write down your ideas and then press play to continue. Go. Well done, Year 5. I'm sure you will have noticed that many of the same things that you would do to create a sense of foreboding are the things that you would do to build suspense. For instance, putting a character in a position of jeopardy or danger, uh, building the pace, uh, creating uncertainty in the plot, hinting at what might happen next. All of those are things that an author might do to create a sense of foreboding. Uh, for, foreboding. Well done. Year five, I'm so impressed with the way that you are learning and applying this new vocabulary. There is one final piece of vocabulary that we're going to learn today before we actually apply this to The Last Wild. And that piece of vocabulary is pathetic fallacy. My turn, pathetic fallacy. Pathetic fallacy. Pathetic fallacy. Great. So pathetic fallacy is when the natural world, especially the weather, is used to reflect the mood and emotion in a story. So, for example, if the author is trying to create a negative atmosphere and a feeling of suspense and danger, then they might choose to set that particular part of the story on a rainy day. And maybe even a rainy night. They might use night time to uh, create a sense of foreboding and a sense that something bad will be about to happen. And storms are a frequent way that authors choose to do this. Think about the Odyssey. There were numerous storms uh, throughout the story and these often uh, mirrored the mood of the story and showed that the characters were in a position of danger. This contrasts with a bright sunny day. If, for example, there's a story about a family going to the fun fair and they're all going to have a wonderful time and it's joyous and celebratory, the author might choose to have set the story on a bright sunny day to mirror the mood of the characters. So that is simply what we mean by pathetic fantasy, when the author uses the natural world, such as the weather, to reflect the mood and emotion in the story. I've explained how pathetic fallacy can be used uh, within writing to create a particular effect. What I'd like you to do now is to read this short extract of text and have a go at responding to the question, how has the author used pathetic fallacy here? You'll need to pause the video to do that. When you've written your response, press play to continue. Go. Great work, year five. So you'll have spotted the fact that the author has used the weather, it was raining, raining a lot, creating noisy splats against the windows. The fact that it was night time, that the moon was out, creating an eerie glow. So all of those are examples of prophetic fallacy and they contribute towards a sense of foreboding. We expect that something bad is about to happen because it's raining and it's dark. And these are things that we associate with negativity. So the author has used pathetic fallacy here. Well done. I'm so impressed with the vocabulary that you have uh, developed an understanding of in this lesson. Let's just quickly recap it. So my turn. Suspense. Suspense. Foreboding. Foreboding. Pathetic fallacy. Pathetic fallacy. Great. We're really developing uh, a wide array of vocabulary so that we will be able to express ourselves in our writing using the most sophisticated vocabulary. So really well done to your commitment to developing your vocabulary. Now, this is what you're going to do. 
you will need pages 21 and pages 22 of the last wild in front of you. You're going to read that part of the text aloud. Whilst you're reading, I want you to focus upon how you think the author builds suspense. Linked to that, how the author creates a sense of foreboding and how pathetic fallacy contributes to that. Then we're going to come back together to share our ideas. So it's your turn now. Spend some time reading that. Off you go. Great. So you've now read that extract of text. We're now going to read it together and as we do so, annotate the text to show how the author has built suspense, how the author has created a sense of foreboding, and how pathetic fallacy is used. So, it was raining that night, raining a lot, hitting the windows in noisy splats. Okay, straight away, I've got pathetic fallacy. The author is using the weather to create a sense of foreboding. Pathetic fallacy creates a sense of foreboding. Remember that means it creates a sense that something bad is about to happen. It wasn't properly dark because of the moon. I was woken up by a strange sound from downstairs. Okay, so we've got a strange sound. So that builds suspense, doesn't it? Because it makes us wonder what has caused the strange sound. I still remember how the toys on my shelf looked cross, with the shadows of the raindrops flicking across them. Shadows, again, uh, suspenseful, aren't they? Because in the shadows we can't see. Things are obscured by shadow. As I turned on the light to make the darkness go away. For a moment, everything in my room, the clothes in a mess on the floor, the toys on the shelf, they all looked normal and happy. But then I heard the door downstairs ripping open. It's curious that the author has said for a moment everything seemed normal and happy. That really does create a sense of foreboding, doesn't it? Because if it's for a moment things were normal and happy, that suggests that soon things will not be normal and happy. So it creates sense of foreboding. But then I heard the, down, the door downstairs ripping open. Okay, again, here is a sense of jeopardy, isn't there? There's a sense of danger. What is it that's downstairs ripping the door open? I got out of bed to go and get Dad. The landing was pitch black. And I couldn't find the light switch. That reminds me of like a horror film where they're always set in the dark, aren't they, when, when something bad is about to happen, and they're fumbling for the light switch and they can't find it again, it creates a sense of foreboding, particularly because Kester isn't able to see what it is that's there. So he's really in a vulnerable, exposed position, isn't he? The door ripped again, and I wanted to cry out for him, but I couldn't. I knew I'd have to go into his room to wake him by shaking his shoulder. Perhaps he just left the door open, I thought, and started to go down the stairs extra quietly so as not to disturb him. Okay, so the fact that Kester's going downstairs alone means that he is vulnerable. Kester going downstairs alone means that he is vulnerable and again contributes to that sense of foreboding that is building and building throughout this passage of writing. I got halfway down when I heard a whispering noise that came in with a wind blowing across my face and making my cheeks cold. Coldness, again, is an example of how the author has created suspense. The door was definitely open. At the bottom of the stairs, I tiptoed across to shut it. I turned around and started to go back. There was a squeak on the floor behind me. How does that create suspense? Well done, it creates suspense by, again, creating uncertainty. 
It makes us ask the question, what's that? Who's there? I looked back and the door had come open again. This time there was a man standing there in the doorway. I couldn't see his face because of the darkness. I felt, ooh, how does that create uh, suspense? I couldn't see his face because of the darkness. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's uncertainty again, isn't it? Mystery. We can't, can't see his face. Something that we can't see is much more uh, threatening to us than something that we can fully see. I felt more frightened than I'd ever felt in my whole life. Kester James, he said quietly. I nodded, not knowing what else to do. You're coming with me. OK, so all of the learning that you have done so far in this lesson has led you to this point. The point where you will be able to write a sophisticated written response to this question. Please read the question aloud, Year 5. Excellent. Beautiful reading. How does the author create suspense when recounting the evening that Kester was taken away from his home? Now, within my written response, I'm going to endeavour to include the vocabulary suspense, foreboding and pathetic fallacy, because those are the three key pieces of vocabulary that we learned in today's lesson. I'm going to start by restating the question. There are many ways, there are many ways in which the author creates suspense when recounting the evening that Kester was taken away from his home. Now, I've written my point. I now need to exemplify this by providing evidence and examples from the text. I'm going to start with the first piece of evidence that I annotated, which was it was raining that night, raining a lot, and I annotated this to say that pathetic fallacy creates a sense of foreboding. So I'm going to open my next paragraph to exemplify this. To exemplify this, the author uses pathetic fallacy to create a sense of foreboding. Uh, I need to explain that further now by making direct reference to the text. I'm going to make direct reference to the fact that it was raining. So rain is often used to create a sense of foreboding because, and this is my explanation, because we associate it with negative events. OK, I'm going to reread my point, evidence and explanation to see how well I'm answering the question so far. There are many ways in which the author creates suspense when recounting the evening that Kester was taken away from his home. To exemplify this, the author uses pathetic fallacy to create a sense of foreboding. Rain is often used to create a sense of foreboding because we associate it with negative events. Good. Now, I have provided one example from the text. As you recall, from when we annotated the text together, there are multiple pieces of evidence within that extract of text that can help me to respond to this question. So what I would like you to go away and do now, Year 5, is to uh, write your own written response to that question 
using multiple pieces of evidence, I would expect that in total you would produce approximately half a page of writing to respond to this question. I can't wait to see your work on Seesaw. I can't wait to be wowed by the wonderful vocabulary you're using. Off you go, Year 5. Thank you.